Uh, welcome to everyone to Young China Watchers. My name is Michael Kehoe. Um, I'm the head of the YCW San Francisco chapter, and I'm joined today by my co-director, Wilson Ho. Um, I, uh, this webinar will be broadcast live now, but also recorded. So if you know other people that were not able to attend, um, it usually takes a little bit of time, maybe a week or two, but we'll have this posted on the YCW website and YouTube account later. Um, a little background on Young China Watchers. Um, Young China Watchers is an all volunteer and completely not-for-profit organization dedicated to delivering the highest quality programming on critical issues facing the China region, the Asia Pacific region and international affair affairs broadly. Um, here in the United States chapters, we're particularly focused on US-China affairs, and we believe the US-China bilateral relationship is the greatest challenge that America faces in the international arena, and we're dedicated to furthering it in a constructive manner. Um, I mentioned the uh, newsletter, so feel free to subscribe if you want to keep up to date. And if you've registered for this webinar, uh, we'll also get you on the email list for future uh, San Francisco chapter events as well. Um, so for the event today, um, over the past year, a flurry of regulations were passed to put new controls on the Chinese tech sector. Um, despite frequent news coverage on the immediate impact to stock values or planned IPOs, which tend to steal the headlines, um, it can be hard to interpret the real long-term effect that these new regulations will have on those investing and doing business in China. Um, and to help decode what's really happening there beyond the headlines, um, YCW San Francisco has invited Ray Ma today for a fireside chat on what she's hearing from on the, on the ground operators working to respond to these new regulations. So without further, further ado, I'll make a quick introduction of Ray and then hand it over to, hand it over to her. Um, so Ray was born in China, but grew up in the US, mostly in the San Francisco Bay Area, where she is currently based. Uh, she has over 15 years of experience in investment banking and investing, spanning seed stage to pre-IPO investing, and sp spent eight of those years working across multiple industries, including real estate and media, as well as technology in Shanghai and Beijing. She is currently an angel investor and advisor to several startups and funds. Ray is also active in philanthropy and currently runs Rookie Fund, a nonprofit student venture fund network in mainland China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. She's vegetarian and would like to be a Chinese calligrapher when she retires. So Ray, I'll hand it over to you. And uh, if you have any other sort of introductions to give about Tech Buzz and sort of the whole business you're running there, I think this would be a good time to uh, cover that. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks for that. I think you you got that from my website, right? From the yep, yeah, website. Yeah, that's your official bio. <laughs> yeah, that. hopefully that's still uh, that. I remember current. writing that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, Tech Buzz China, which I work on full time now, it started off as a podcast, basically for fun and has now evolved into a community for investors and operators and uh, hopefully more in the future but i don't have the proper licenses yet so i can't talk about those businesses <laughs> but uh but basically um you know if, if you're if you're somewhat like really serious or i should say really serious about china tech you're free to come and number one listen to our podcast and or try to join our community we do have a quiz you have to take before you can join our community that's a thing i learned from billy billy um and the passing rate right now is 58 57 percent so are you testing that they're truly china nerds yeah, yeah. It's not it's not it's not actually that hard, but I think it requires, you know, for you to have some some background. Yeah. Gotcha. Great. Um, so with that, um, let's dive into the questions. And we have a couple of questions prepared that we'll start with, but I highly, highly encourage attendees to uh, put questions in the chat as well. Um, and we'll definitely uh, keep some time at the end to come to the audience question. So if anything pops into your head, feel free to add it to the chat and that'll be our sort of cue to follow up um, after we go through the initial set of questions. So just to kick things off, Ray, um, what are some of the biggest regulations that have come out in the last year? And are there any common threads that you see or is it just sort of independent areas of the government interested in sort of regulating their territory? Yeah, so I think you can think of the sort of, cat I would categorize the regulations into three broad buckets. One would be, uh, you know, China, very China specific. So um, like the things that are gaming regulations on minors or short video content regulations, that's very sort of just China being China, right? Where um, the government cares a lot about the content that's online. Um, and I don't think you're gonna find, you, you may find similar things in other countries, but, uh, they may not have sort of the same reasons for, for being there. And then you have another bucket 
um, which the other two buckets I think are more important. The uh, one bucket would be sort of regulations catching up to the rest of the developed world. So I would put it in there like sort of antitrust legislation, um, some of the data security, uh, et, et cetera. Maybe the FinTech, some of the FinTech things, because again, um, some of those rules well, some of the startups, actually, the way they were being run, the companies, the way they were being run, probably wouldn't fly in the US, right? So it was more of a catch up. And then you have the third and final bucket, which I think is probably most interesting, would be the ones where China's trying to get ahead of regulations for emerging technologies. So the example, I guess the best example, maybe the only example, um, or at least the most notable example we have right now is algorithms, right? So China came out with some guidelines, not yet. Well, they're just in draft form, so they're not yet finalized, but these are uh, attempts at regulating um, basically computer algorithms, right? That we're using in, in software and what the companies who run these algorithms, what are their responsibilities in terms of transparency to the uh, users? And, 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 and I think in that respect, uh, we can see that China has already stated, right, for algorithms are a type of, you know, simple AI. So um, China has already stated that they want to get ahead um, and be world leading, in, so to speak, in terms of these regulations. Um, I can easily think of probably in the future, there might be, China might be faster than many other countries when it comes to regulating um, some of the other emerging technologies, maybe in bio, um, maybe in you know autonomous driving, something that I know a little bit more about than, than bio, uh, et cetera. So those are the three main buckets I would put them into. And you have seen a lot of activity. Most of the activity I would say are in the first two, right? Because again, the emerging technologies are still uh, up and coming, but I think in the future, we'll see more in the third bucket. And what do you, um... I think that the bucket framework is really helpful for understanding the difference between sort of the different uh, common threads between them. I'm, I'm kind of curious if most of them come in the first two buckets. I guess we can kind of put the China specific regulation like gaming or content a little bit to the side because I, I agree that's kind of more um, China is more apt to, uh, let's say, sort of regulate lifestyle or on, in the gaming piece, right? If, it's, if there's public outcry on gaming addiction, they're kind of more likely to snap back and react to that. Um, but on the parts where they're just catching up with the rest of the world, I'm kind of curious why it seems like it's coming all uh, in a fast sequence um, as opposed to, you know, or is this a faster uh, grouping of regulation than we've previously seen before where they're kind of doing a lot in this bucket all at once for some reason. And one theory I heard about it was potentially that COVID kind of delayed things and they didn't want to disrupt industry when the economy was already really sensitive. Um, and so now they're kind of I don't know, it's like pent up demand, regulatory demand that they're now, it's kind of rushing all out now. Mm -hmm. um, I would think I, I have the opposite um, interpretation, which is that COVID accelerated things, but but sure, I think COVID played a huge part. So I would say, um, again, uh, the, if we're talking about the second bucket, right, where a lot of Chinese regulations are basically catching up to the developed West, the US and Europe, uh, specifically, I think antitrust is probably the best example of that. Well, what you're looking at actually is the culmination of several years of work. Again, I'm not like a policy or a legal expert, but when these things came out, I actually went and talked to people who um, have been working on this space. And you know, you don't even have to do that. You could have just gone to um, some law firms, Jones Day, et cetera, who have large offices in China. And if you go back a couple of years, you'll actually see that, you know, specifically antitrust has been a movement that's been building up over, for a while. Um, and even actually before antitrust was, I guess, put out against uh, digital platforms at the end of last year, actually at the beginning of the year, they were, they were, or not at the beginning of the year, in the middle of the year, they were actually put out first against automotive companies. So I think, you know, a lot of the paranoia that, oh, this is just solely directed at big tech. Again, if you look at fully what's happening, it's not true. And um, that's been in process for a long time, way before COVID. I think, 
for um, some of the more granular internet uh, related um, things like uh, like the gig worker. So, so I didn't list exactly all the things that have happened, but for example, like the gig worker, uh, you know, regulations in China are actually right now, there's still guidelines where, you know, platform companies are supposed to partake more in, you know, providing the social insurance for gig workers and making sure they're not, you know, quote unquote, trapped by the algorithms and put in unsafe working conditions, trying to fulfill their, delivery routes or whatever, these things I would say um, have been in the public and have been a topic of discussion for not quite as long as, you know, they haven't been deeply contemplated like antitrust, but they have been in the public this, uh, forums for a little bit, let's call it a couple of years. And they really came to a head last year because of COVID. So I would actually argue that COVID really accelerated some of these things because we see, you know, the economy uh, just like here in the U.S., become much more dependent on digital services and platforms. Um, you know, food delivery becoming like really huge, telemedicine, um, e-commerce, et cetera, because, you know, people don't want to be exposed to the pandemic. So I would say a lot of these uh, more minor, I, I'm, I'm going to call them more minor regulations because, again, a lot of them are not law. They're really uh, just guidelines at this point. Um, and they may become a lot later, but right now they're they're not yet. Uh, are are actually accelerated by COVID. Um, another thing is that you could argue, and I'm not sure we'll ever know the real answer, right? But I don't think the government's going to come out and answer this. Is that the government has been so successful in dealing with COVID in China, and the general sentiment um, of the government's competence is very high right now appraisals are, you know, very positive. So some people are saying, you know, some, some popular commentators are saying that, uh, you know, the government's just sort of riding this wave of approval mm -hmm. and um, putting, you know, getting everything through the doors that they were hoping to get done, <laughs> right? So while, while things are very positive right now uh, in terms of trust in the government from mm -hmm. the people, so not necessarily in terms of, you know, er everything. I think the economy has some mixed signals, et cetera. So uh, those are the answers that I heard that I think I find pretty credible. But again, I think it's a, I like to say it's multifactorial at the end of the day. So there's not going to be sort of one, you know, single thing that explains everything. Yep. Yep. No, I wouldn't expect a simple, uh, such a simple answer, but I do really um, think it's an interesting point you raised about the sentiment or sort of trust in the government and riding that, because I think that piece doesn't get covered as much. I mean, I think from a Western perspective, we forget how high the approval ratings of the government are in China, right? We kind of just assume because it's not our system or, you know, if we don't agree with it, other people there might not agree with the system. But yeah, I mean, my, from talking to people on the ground in China as well, a lot of them do trust that they'll sort of guide the economy broadly, correctly in the right direction, even if the initial regulations are kind of unclear or cause some chaos. Um, yeah, and, and I, I, I do think it's important to sort of caveat that with a little bit of like, I try to talk to people from all sort of classes when you're, you know, an expat working in finance or in internet, it's really easy to be honest to only talk to the 1% who I find to be generally more skeptical, disapproving, whatever you want to say mm -hmm. of authority in general, but, you know, in, up and including the government. Um, but I do find that like when I talk to sort of, you know, your quote unquote, every you know, normal people, people who are not living in the first tier cities, uh, you know, I, I don't do this like full time or anything, but I try to reach out as much as possible. And I do find it's very different. Their, their perspectives are very different there. They do seem to be much more much more positive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but and they're I, not the ones getting interviewed in media. That's right. the problem. Right. Yeah. That's why right. you well, don't hear from them. And this you is why we have the, you here. You yeah. got, you that's why you hear from the lone documentary filmmaker in Guangzhou who's like very upset, but you don't hear from like, you know, whatever your average, I don't know, nurse in like, uh, or something like yeah. some random city. Yeah. 
Um, oh, yeah, that's a that's a topic. You, you that actually, Beijing, but yeah. anyway. <laughs> um, so, so what have been some of the most noticeable immediate impacts on the tech sector um, now that these new regulations have passed? And I know that's a really broad question. So, if you want to kind of go deeper into the sectors you're more familiar with and how they're reacting to these regulations, um, I'd be curious to hear. The most noticeable immediate impact. Yeah, sort of. You know how um, these. You know how they responded, or you know if people. Um, are, are companies kind of laying low and not making big moves or in terms of acquisition or IPO? I mean, how are they sort of responding to this general environment of, of sort of increased uh, releasing of regulations? Yeah, so I think, well, the first one that uh, affects, well, investors disproportionately, this is, um, so I get a lot, I get asked a lot of questions on it, but, you know, maybe, maybe operationally doesn't really matter, is the, uh, is right now the, you can consider it sort of a suspension of listings, right, abroad for Chinese tech companies. And this general question mark around the, uh, surrounding the uh, going forward, like what is the state of VIE structures, which is the, is the uh, structure that, you know, Chinese companies use to get foreign investment in quote unquote, actually regulated industry or restricted industries, such as a lot of internet um, companies actually fall under this category. Uh, so that really started off because, because actually DD, um, I think as everyone now knows, uh, was told not to go public and then decided to go public and got a slap. Uh, very heavy, not, not a slap, really got like a punch to the face, is now under heavy investigation um, and has really, uh, is now changing basically how the Chinese government is going to regulate um, how companies pursue listings abroad. And there is no answer yet as to what will happen exactly. I think I've heard um, a lot of different opinions on that. I think I would say if I had to put bundle them all together. People are mildly optimistic. Some are actually a lot more pessimistic than, than I am, but um, I think overall people think it will be resolved in, um, you know, let's call it by next year. But that is the immediate rain cloud hanging over Chinese tech companies right now, because um, so many of them cannot list and need to list and you need to raise capital or don't have a good plan for listing you know you, you, let's say they're like in the growth stage they don't know what's going to happen and that's going to affect sort of their valuation fundraising plans and i haven't seen this happen yet but it could also you know go all the way trickle down all the way into the uh, you know very early stages of venture when maybe limited partners here in the US endowments and whatnot start really questioning um, if they can, you know, invest in, in China at all. So, uh, you know, again, it hasn't happened in a, like a very obvious, uh, it has happened in a sort of obvious way in that people I think are taking a breather until the regulations um, become more clear, but it hasn't, it hasn't been like, um, people haven't decided to pull out of China or anything like that. But that is, that is probably the biggest rain cloud. Uh, other than that, operationally, I would say the things that we were talking about earlier, which are more specific to, you know, the, the antitrust. So you see WeChat and, um, uh, Do, you know, WeChat opening up their platform to external links, right? That's a result of of, you know, basically the antitrust regulations where you can't engage in, you know, these kind of anti-competitive behaviors. And then you see that the um, China specific, like we were saying, this sort of Chinese characteristics regulations uh, on, you know, content, uh, content regulations and time limits, especially for minors, um, things like that. These are uh, these also have uh, impacts operationally, but they're more on obviously specific sectors. So I think the antitrust and uh, data have the highest um, impact across all companies. Um, and the data stuff, um, if I, and I'm rambling a little bit, but if, if I may add, because it's so new, it really kicked in, um, the law kicked in September 1st, right? So we will, we will see um, exactly how, how uh, difficult it will be to comply. And, um, you know, I think, I think until more cases of non-compliance 
show up, we won't really know exactly. It's not, the the outlines are clear, but the details are still a little fuzzy. So we we still don't know yet exactly um, what is going to be allowed and what is not going to be allowed. Yep. So it seems like on a couple fronts, there's kind of a general reaction. So on the IPO front, there's a general reaction that people need to slow down and probably spend I mean, I'm guessing they're going to spend more time doing proactive work with whatever the re- relevant regulator is before they try to IPO to avoid a DD like mistake. Because I, I mean, I know at least from sort of contacts I've had in China, they'll have a whole internal team or department in government relations that their whole job, I mean, maybe that's sort of uh, the American equivalent of lobbyists or whatever, you know, our corporations would have in Washington, DC, that their whole job is to be sort of proactive and go and talk through, you know, how they might, how these regulations might apply to them. Um, do you think that's kind of a, a similar thing that's happening with the data piece now that it's such a gray area? You know, are companies mm-hmm. kind of waiting? Are they sort of pausing and investing more time reaching out to regulators to try to figure it out? Or is it more they kind of wait and see what mm-hmm. the bigger companies that are willing to take a risk or do and then use that as sort of a case study on how the government's going to respond? Yeah, I was just, so I'll break the data piece into two things. Again, sure. data, there's just everyday operational protection. I think that's actually fairly clear. Um, people, you know, compare it to European uh, GDPR, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of it's similar. Again, the, the finer details are going to have to be worked out, but the broad strokes for the listing part, I think that's just big question mark right now. And we, we won't know until at least I would say decision is reached um, around DD, right? So uh, yeah. So so I would break the data into those two pieces. Yep. Got it. Okay. And then people will are kind of willing to wait for the DD sort of case study to be settled before taking a risk on their own IPO, or at least maybe that's what their investors are and shareholders are advising them to do. Oh yeah. Well, actually you bring up a really good point, which is, well, first of all, they, I don't think they have a choice, right? (laughs) So Mm -hmm. um, it's, and by the way, it's not just the China side because after this DD situation, I'm sure right. you've seen the SEC has repeatedly put out statements saying, hey guys, uh, there's risks to investing in Chinese VIEs. We want them to have a, you know more uh, disclosures, you know, whatever, more explanations of these structures. And we're going to investigate more about the extent of government uh, risk. So it's not just the Chinese side, it's the US side also, there's a lot of pressure. And you know, for good reason, because if you're a DD shareholder, you're probably not very happy and you're wondering if this could have been prevented or if you should believe the company and say that they truly didn't know. Right, right. And I'm sure it's not even just DD, but other sort of a high profile cases of fraud in China. I mean, I'm just thinking of famous ones like Luckin or other large companies that had sort of accounting issues or diligence issues. I could see. Oh, that right. Yeah, exactly. Sort of there's the US regulators. Right. There's the overall. I mean, there's so many. Yeah, there's so many things. I feel like, yeah, the, the, the you. Uh, yeah, we should probably mention that, you know, overarching all this. There's also the fact that, you know, China and the U.S. have not yet come to an agreement about accounting standards and whether mm-hmm. or not. And so the U.S. side wants to have access to the, you know, the books. Right. And China has not yet agreed to that. So yep. we'll see if it happens If because if it doesn't happen, technically right now there's a deadline of, I think, two years from now, because it was passed a, a while ago, a deadline three years, and um, then co- Chinese companies will have to delist. And, okay. and you know, there's many other, re- there's many other ways too, the US government could say, uh, Chinese companies are not, you know, investable by US citizens or whatever, placing them on certain lists. But I think that is the one that really affects every, you know, Chinese company. Yep. Um, and I think this is a good good uh, point to segue to talking about, a little bit about how the Chinese government regulates differently. So I know there's kind of a wide range of laws here, but then how these laws are applied in China. Um, and I don't think we can necessarily paint a, a broad brush um, for all regulations, but um, you know, for example, how might they view regulation as something that positively encourage markets that are healthy in the long term, as opposed to just you know curtailing maybe the most negative of practices. Yeah, so I think that's one important thing that we do have to recognize that this is just this is just how the Chinese government thinks, right? It's just fundamentally different uh, set of assumptions from maybe where we're sitting here 
especially where I am in the Bay Area, where a lot of people just automatically go to regulations are bad. Um, it's really not how the Chinese government thinks. And in fact, they um, actively say this, but I, I think really believe this as well, which is that they believe a, you know, a healthy industry need a healthy industry cannot be created without having regulations. And I quoted actually a um, unicorn CFO uh, guy who's working on their IPO uh, or had were yeah close close to working on their company's IPO. And I was I remember asking them about how they felt about all these regulations, and they gave like a pretty funny answer. Uh, they basically said, you know, where there are many Chinese people, you really need regulations. If you don't have regulations, it'll just be chaos. You have too many, then of course, you know, business will die. But um, it really goes to show uh, even, again, even like a company who's not necessarily happy with all the regulations um, do, does understand that without, without some kind of guide rails, right, the industry could descend into chaos, as we've seen with many other uh, industries in China, and um, it, it is actually bad for everyone involved, right? It's it's not just bad for consumers; it's also bad for all the co companies, as well. So the the regulators, the government, believe this is necessary, and I would say um, to to some degree the companies um, and and then of course consumers as well. So everyone's actually actually on board with some uh, regulations. Uh, I would also say that. You know, for um, uh, China, like they are really, really trying to make sure that they see regulations as, especially for internet industry, as a weakness in the country. As uh, internet, I think companies really were very loosely regulated before. Mm -hmm. So I have less experience um, with this part per se, but. Um, you know, recently was talking to a friend who has deep experience in financial services and um, he's running his own fund now, but he made a really good point. He actually made this point in 2019. And he said, it's very important that internet companies start interfacing with regulators and start explaining to policymakers what they're doing because, uh, you know, having coming, uh, coming from the financial services side, that happens a lot. There's a very open dialogue and, you know, people are always talking to the regulators and there's a lot of written down rules on what happens, you know, who's responsible for what, but in internet, he found that it was absolutely missing. And so he had been counseling his portfolio companies actually um, for the last two years that they should, you know, even before all these regulations came down, that they should go and proactively find their, you know, regulators and make sure they know who's in charge of what, and then um, try to anticipate what's coming because for sure it is going to come. The internet has just become too big of an industry, too important part of the economy to be ignored and neglected mm -hmm. like it has been so far. Yeah. And I've also, I've heard from others operating in the country that um, they've seen other cycles of kind of looser and then tightening regulation because they want the, the government knows that they need to leave it loose for the, that particular sector to grow to begin with. Right. So if it had been tight regulation from the outset, they wouldn't have kind of seen an explosion of creativity or new business models or kind of, uh, just sort of innovation in general. But then now that it's mature, they feel it's actually more dangerous to let it run just fully unregulated uh, and it can kind of absorb some of this regulatory shock now uh, so for the long-term health they'll tighten it and then that that can actually happen on a sector by sector basis so um yeah, so kind yeah. Of an, i would say like an example is in uh, that i'm familiar mm -hmm. with is education right it's like they kind of let it go completely loose and and uh you know now there was some you know public outcry in terms of the learning culture and sort of potentially <laughs> uh you know overdoing the private tutoring piece um and then they kind of come back and they kind of let it grow, it became a healthy industry, and now it's time to sort of tighten controls and, and make sure it's not causing any sort of social issues and it can grow healthy in the long term. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in education, is, they were, it was, you, you think know, it's a special it was considered case. Wild, yeah. widely considered to be unhealthy, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I think what you, uh, maybe a better example is just like, um, is uh, even like a, we did an episode on the podcast on telemedicine, right? So what China likes to do is sort of what's called sandbox method, where they see an interesting, um, you know, innovation. And especially if it's something that's like, 
you know, not too out there, but like telemedicine, for example, is actually pretty easy to understand. So what they would do is grant certain uh, cities, provinces, um, oftentimes actually underdeveloped provinces, but you know, it could be really anywhere, uh, grant them special permission to try out experiments. And this could be, you know, in one place, this could be in a couple dozen places, really depends on what we're talking about. And then they will uh, go, depending on how this works, they will modify it and roll it out to the whole nation or kill it. Right. So uh, on the fundraising, I'm more familiar with the fundraising front because I wasn't an operator, but in 2015, as the country is trying to push, you know, innovation and encourage like venture funding, um, there were pilot projects that I could, that, that I was pitched on that, you know, places like Chengdu and Tibet, like try to get me <laughs> to go to open like special USD denominated funds. Now that's mm -hmm. generally not allowed in the rest of China, uh, but there were these, again, special places that had a, a sandbox, so to speak, where you could get, um, you know, permission. And usually it would be only be for a couple of years, right? Mm -hmm. Or something where, yeah, you, you, you could get some interesting things approved and you could try them. And then depending on how it worked, it, it may or may not be rolled out to the rest of the country. And, and in the case of telemedicine, for example, obviously it has been uh, with, with modifications. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. So maybe education was more kind of, uh, this is another point I kind of wanted to highlight is some of the regulations, and maybe this can be its own bucket, is the government actually being pretty responsive to public outcry? You know, I mean, maybe the kind of the algorithm regulation of delivery drivers, I know there was some public sort of backlash in terms of the negative lifestyle it's imposed on those workers, and then also on the education piece, but the government is actually pretty responsive to monitoring also just kind of public outcry of sectors that have grown unregulated and just by sort of nature of whatever they're sort of uh, optimizing for profit is, has caused some sort of social issue as well. Uh, well, you could argue that, I mean, I think depending on who you talk to, some people would say that they are not responsive enough, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that it shouldn't have gotten to this point where, especially for the after school tutoring, it shouldn't have gotten to this point where it was taking over students' lives and basically, you know, not necessarily more well, kind of basically bankrupting parents. And uh, yeah, so <laughs> yeah. I, I think I think a lot of people would disagree that they were responsive enough. But but I guess maybe the maybe the the conclusion could be that they eventually responded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, agreed. Yeah, I guess it kind of depends on who you ask and if you think they acted fast enough. Um, right. So um, so uh, next question, do you think the recent wave of regulations is one of the government's tools for encouraging more talent or investment to move from one field or another? So, mm -hmm. you know, kind of uh, where I've heard this pitched is the e-commerce sector is really healthy in China. You know, you can get food delivered to you super quickly wherever you are, but is that necessarily mm -hmm. the best use of kind of the best talent in China as opposed to like harder industries or deep tech industries that the government is actively trying to encourage? Um, do you think that regulations have been used as a tool to kind of move capital and talent to what the government considers higher priority industries? Yeah, so I probably disagree with this yeah. um, right. pitch. Uh, and I would say, so So I don't disagree with it in its entirety. I guess what I would say is I would give context and say that, uh, look, this is actually pretty natural progression, okay? Because what you have in China is, um, Actually, do, do people know that in Silicon Valley, the split of enterprise software, for example, and consumer software investment has always been heavily, heavily in favor of enterprise for like the past, you know, two, two plus decades? Because that's just, that's just kind of how the economy works, right? Like how many, you know, how, how much software are you paying for? Um, and then yet, yes, like, I guess, you know, for internet companies, they've discovered this digital advertising model and, but it is like, it is very much a winner take most mm -hmm. market for many of these business models. Whereas for, um, you know, a, a lot of other innovations uh, that companies need, right, to increase productivity, like think about the, the software stack that, you know, your company yeah. needs to run itself. Hundreds probably, of yeah. yeah, I don't think it's, I don't think it's at all comfortable to write what you, mm -hmm. you as an individual are using. So, um, and then of course you have the fact that like uh, in China, there's the additional layer that China has a, a really active supply chain has been 
you know, diligently building out its manufacturing base for the last four decades. So then what you have in China is a venture 10 years ago was heavily, heavily, heavily um, consumer software. Right. And then five years ago, you start shift, you start seeing people shift away from consumer digital platforms to much more enterprise and cloud. Right. Um, and then and then maybe maybe other things in consumer, but they'd be more like brands and, and less of the uh, platforms that, you know, like the 10 cents and uh, Alibaba's of the world. So and, and now you have basically um, because of the. Uh, you know, manufacturing, or I shouldn't say even because of manufacturing, I would say because there's been more spotlight on um, manufacturing, keeping manufacturing high as a percentage of GDP in the country, as well as bottlenecks that have been presented because of US sanctions and, you know, the trade war and all this stuff. Uh, so a lot of attention, for example, on semiconductors, you do see more investment going in there, right? But I would say this is just like a natural pro uh, progression of a more healthy, diverse, you know, um, economy where uh, consumer tech is is sort of like the the easier. Well, I don't want to offend anyone here who's working on consumer tech, but <laughs> but um, like uh, a lot of people think it's a it's sort of more easy, right, than other products to at least get started on. So you saw a lot of investment go into it. But again, mm -hmm. now China has matured. So even before 2020, before this uh, more uh, all like total nation buy-in into more hard tech, uh, Th there's already been a natural shift out of consumer tech because I would argue the previous balance was was not balanced. And it was just um, the previous mix was not balanced and it was unsustainable. It was never going to be that way. In fact, like, again, 10 years ago, like I remember sitting on VC panels where we would all be talking about like, when is it, when are people going to realize there are other things to invest in besides consumer? Mm -hmm. internet? Yeah, so... I, I don't think you can purely attribute it to uh, the government's, you know, wishes because the government's push of hard science and technology has been there for a long time. Yep. It's just that the talent, the capital, and the market wasn't there, right? And and now I think we're there. Of course, the government. I, I do want to say that I agree that the government has, you know, is an important force. But I, if 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 it was just solely up to the government, you know, this this stuff would have happened, um, you know, uh, 10 years ago, SMIC yep. would be the leading semiconductor company already, you know? Yeah, so. well, I guess, yeah, I guess the people pose the question because they're wondering if regulation is the tool that the government wants to use to encourage those industries. I know they have a lot of other tools, right? I mean, they might provide subsidies, they have those special programs, like, I don't know if it's a special economic zone or kind of what you were referencing were small cities or, you know, they'll set up experiments to encourage certain I see. to grow. You know, it's not okay. just, I guess the context might be, it's not just regulations as one, one tool, because I think some people were interpreting it as, you know, consumer internet has kind of gone out of control. If we place regulations on it, maybe talent entrepreneurs will move to a kind of greener pastures and work on those other areas. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, like, as I was, um, Maybe I didn't explain it clearly earlier, but it, that's already naturally happening, right? Yep, so yep. you already see that because opportunity has become more and more expensive in in uh, these you know certain verticals. So either you have to go to a really big company, or if you want to you and know, work nine nine six, or uh, or I guess you could, you're still working nine nine six as your own entrepreneur, but you might have a much more upside doing something else, right? Uh, doing you know uh, software for the supply chain or. Something Something like that. So that's already sort of naturally happening because of market forces. But I would I would like to say, yeah, again, I, I don't agree with that because I don't think that re the regulations are meant to divert people from uh, these quote unquote softer tech because you see very clearly that the government is act actually still promoting, you know, soft tech. So let's let's use e-commerce as soft tech, right? Uh, soft tech, um, you know, e-commerce, the government has realized that really added to the economic development of the country. Um, so they're doing two things. They're basically saying, we love e-commerce. We think it's great. We need you to do a better job of it, of spreading it through the rest of the country. So to rural China, um, the, which 
you know, includes building a lot, building out a lot more logistics, right? Mm -hmm. And then we also want you to build this abroad. So you actually see there is a ton of uh, special ec economic zones for cross-border e-commerce uh, because, you know, we want like, and, and why not, especially for China, that's manufacturing so much of the world's products. They also want to sell it, right? So uh, it's not, it's not really diverting people from mm -hmm. soft tech per se. It's, it's, it, there's actually still a lot of, um, there's still a lot of support. I think that it just gets overshadowed by the, the regulations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. No, that, I, that makes sense. And I, I don't think it's their primary motivation either. I just know it's kind of out there as a potential theory. So I wanted to raise it. Um, so I'm going to switch over. I know we have a couple questions left on our list, but now that we have about 15 minutes left, um, I want to switch over to one question from the audience here from Don. Um, he asked, does the, data uh, does the data requirement laws or other regulations increase the hurdle for new players to enter certain markets? While it may increase the compliance departments at China Tech, does it create a new moat for the big China Tech once it's put in place? So I'm guessing... I'm guessing it's uh, the question is for domestic players, um, but you know, does the increased regulatory challenge and the you know internal capacity you have to build to address that provide another moat for big tech companies in China? I think so. Unfortunately, I don't think I know the answer to that. So I've read a lot of people's uh, you know takes, experts talk about this, and the I, okay. So I'll just say my intuition, which may or may not be correct, because I have no idea. I've never dealt with compliance or, or data security. But um, basically, a lot of people have, uh, experts have looked at what's happened with, you know, um, other data regulations in other countries. And it seems that it has strengthened, actually, incumbents. Mm -hmm. Right, because there's the cost of maintaining and and complying, but there's also the fact that now if you if you already have all this, if you're already sitting on this data, it's harder to get access to it if you, if you don't already have it, right? Because now uh, there are now pr more protections for consumers, etc. So uh, I guess my answer would be to. I tentatively agree with the question posed and think that could be the outcome, uh, but I, I really truly have no idea how it will turn out. Yeah, I do think it's hard to say, and it kind of depends on how exactly enforcement is done as well, too. Um, and, and also kind of timing since the regulation has been released. I think when it's first released, kind of the cost of complying could be at its highest. There's no sort of tools built around it or established processes. But then as the, it's sort of been out in the, in the world for longer, uh, maybe smaller, medium-sized businesses have a playbook they can copy on how to respond. It might be most expensive at the beginning. But I guess for the studies you looked at, it was that like in GDPR, for example, that created long-term advantages for larger companies due to the difficulty of compliance. Well, even that, I think it's only a few years. So no, no, it's I just I basically new, yeah. just read what other people wrote. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't look into the first, per, uh, you know, I didn't look at the data firsthand myself. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, additional question from the audience here. Um, has China's regulations domestically also changed the way it approaches foreign policy in emerging frontier markets? Um, and then parentheses, one belt, one road. Has China's regulations also changed the way it approaches foreign policy? Um, I guess I, pers I only really focus on tech. Um, I am not sure. I mean, I can think of... I would say, okay, maybe what I would say is I have no idea about one belt, one road, but I think when it comes to uh, foreign policy, again, not an expert on foreign policy, I do think what is obvious to me in um, how China thinks about just tech in general and uh, is that it really wants to make sure it doesn't fall behind anymore and isn't reliant on um, foreign technology as it is right now, actually. Uh, you know, there are various articles online um, talking about China's choke point technologies. And if you look at it, um, a lot of China's like very, very core, like infrastructure things, um, air, airplanes, you know, spaceships, uh, high-speed rail, a lot of them have like, you know, these engines uh, and of course, semiconductors, mm -hmm. uh, various like, you know, photo, um, 
I shouldn't, I actually, I'm not going to say it because I don't remember what the exact word is, but all these high technologies, while China might be the place where these things are manufactured, they don't actually own the core IP, right? They're sort of like the assembly line. So I think that that is going to affect, the, if, if we're talking about not regulations, but more like strategy, domestic tech strategy, I think that is probably going to have more effect on how it thinks about how it interacts with other foreign countries. Um, but specifically with it, with regard to one belt, one road, um, I have no idea. The only thing I know is that Again, earlier when I was talking about cross-border e-commerce, that's a big, that comes up all the time as in China wanting to build a quote unquote silk, uh, you know, silk, uh, sorry, digital silk road mm -hmm. and e-commerce is supposed to be a big part of that. Uh, but I also feel like that seems to be just a slogan because <laughs> like e-commerce is kind of like, yeah, it's, just, it's growing globally because of COVID. So of course, and then because China makes so much, it's it's really this it's going to be the source for a lot of the e-commerce. So, yep. Yes. Yeah. yeah and I mean, I mean I don't, and I don't know if this really qualifies as foreign policy either, but I know that the data regulations are going to have impacts on a lot of the international companies that work there. So I mean if you consider GDPR to have, you know, foreign policy implications in terms of what it imposed on, you know, multinational tech companies based in the US and how they have to change operations, there will be a similar impact to multinationals that operate in China. Uh, so sorry, not also yeah. related to One Belt, One Road, but yeah. I do think no idea. Yeah. I don't know if you could count that as foreign policy, though, that seems. Yeah, it's more but... kind of protecting their own citizens <laughs> data. Um, but yeah, uh, sorry, we're not we're not experts on that particular one. Um, so a question here from Darren, and this also uh, I'm not sure if we can answer this one fully, but to what extent do you think these changes have been driven by Xi Jinping's desire to improve his approval rating for quote reelection next year? Yeah, so I don't know, like uh, anecdotally, I feel like he has extremely high approval ratings. I don't think it's really, um, if, it, if it is for anything, it's not for the people. I've heard other people say it's for, I don't know, the rest of the people in the party, uh, you know, the, the other sort of leading uh, politicians and bureaucrats, that might be possible, but I don't really think it's for the masses. That's sort of my personal opinion. Um, I, I just like, I just have trouble imagining that that is a, that is a reason that's happening right now, because again, the COVID, like the COVID response was so well received. Mm -hmm. um, it just seems like the, the, the current administration has like a crazy amount of support from your average, right? Your average citizen. Yep. Yep, agreed. Yeah. If, um, if anything, actually, if I may yeah, add, okay. if anything, the regulations sometimes have like sort of unintended consequences that might make that approval rating go down, right? Like in the, like, in the short term, talking? right? I mean, yeah. would the bet be that, you know, the healthier long-term effects of, you know, a, a tech economy and not just tech. I know we're focusing on tech in this discussion, but right. I mean, I think the bet is that it'll just be long-term better health across these industries. So that'll pay off later, even if there's some temporary sort of disappointment with how uh, how big of a sort of immediate impact they make or confusion, sort of fear, uncertainty, and doubt they have in the immediate Im uh, implementation. So, right, I mean, I, yeah, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, but I would argue that the average citizen doesn't care about that. The average citizen doesn't care about, you know, how China does as a whole. I mean, maybe on a very superficial level, but what they really care about is, you know, are, are their houses going up in value, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Can they afford their kid's education? Is their kid going to have a better life than they are? Um, can they afford quality healthcare? These are the things that are top of mind for them. And I, I don't know that, by the way, like I don't know that all of these changes necessarily um, are going to be uniformly helping with those large, large lifestyle questions. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so going to Maximilian's question, do you, uh, oh, this is a big one as well, um, do you interpret the waves of new regulation and further potential sudden regulatory action as a signal that markets are gradually replaced by a new form of command economy 2.0 in line with the increased political centrality of socialist ideology? So that's a big, <laughs> it's, there's a lot in there, uh, but I, I would guess kind of the core piece is, do you think this is a general movement towards more of a command economy as opposed to market economy 
and just sort of had more heavily regulated with central control? Um, I don't personally think so. I don't really see, at least for with tech, right? So again, um, tech is really mainly privately owned, right? Very little state owned. So whenever I talk about tech, there are some, usually some other people who are much more well-versed in state-owned enterprises. They'll say like, well, that's not what's happening with SOEs, but so I have no idea what's happening with SOEs. But I would say in tech that I don't see any evidence of that happening. Um, I don't think, so So again, socialist, socialist ideology, uh, whatever, notwithstanding, um, I don't think that is showing up in, you know, at, at all in how the government is um, dealing with tech companies, right? So all the things that we're seeing that are about, like earlier, remember I said the three buckets, that the first bucket sort of like the Chinese, you know, unique to China things, the, the content related things, that's really something that you see, um, you know, the, the Chinese government uh, like exerting on all of media. It's, it's more that digital media in the, in the past has been more loosely regulated. But, be, but if you consider, if you accept the fact that digital media is also media, right? Social media is also media, you know, UGC is also media, then all these things are just largely in line with how the country has been run. It's not, it's not anything more or, you know, it's, it's not like more extreme. Just catching uh, or up. different. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's just applying what's already existing uh, to, to um, you know, to a different category now. And, and I think like, again, you have to read what the uh, government considers to be harmful for minors, for example, in China. And I think you'd be surprised. Like I was personally surprised when I read what the Communist Youth League considers as harmful for kids. Like they consider um, kids watching um, content that is showing off excessive wealth to be, it's like listed in the same category as like cyberbullying, right? Mm -hmm. As like, it's like, you know, here are the 11 things or whatever it was that we don't want kids exposure to on the internet. And then like number one, it's like, you are not number one, but like one of these things that are like, you know, anti, anti-nationalist, um, anti-China things, you know, and you, you, they're already like listed, right? So I don't think it's, um, it, it, to to then enforce these standards on the short video or uh, uh, social media platforms after years of not really enforcing them is not necessarily some, I guess like it's not necessarily like a political statement to, to, to me that should be so alarming. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's also, I guess, other context there is some of the regulations, maybe some of the antitrust I mean, it's hard because there are so many buckets, but some of the regulations are ones that were even are even being considered in the U.S., right? I mean, it's not like, like, I mean, I mean, some of them are kind of unique to China, but some of them is them kind of being more proactive and things that are even discussed pretty seriously in the U.S. on, you know, antitrust. And so I don't, you know, unless that is also a signal of kind of socialist type stuff, which I don't think it is. Um, I think it's kind of hard to say that the current wave of regulations is, is evidence that they want to go back towards sort of a centralized command economy. Yeah, I mean, like, since people like quoting Xi Jinping all the time, um, I always like to tell people you can go to qstheory.cn, which is, you know, the party journal, and they have an English version and you can do search anytime you want to know what the party thinks about, you know, XYZ, just put in the search term and query for yourself. And uh, I know that definitely, like, I haven't read that many speeches, uh, but people have asked me what the party has said, you know, in an attempt to understand what's going on in the financial markets and uh as far as i know they've definitely said explicitly that like the soviet union command economy does not work mm -hmm. and we do not want to do that so uh, socialism yes uh the soviet style command economy a definite no yeah yep all right, so last one, because I know we only have a minute left here. Um, so Darren asked, as a tech investor in China, are you in, quote, wait and see mode? And if so, what are you waiting for to see? Um, so I am not right now um, investing money myself in China. Uh, people ask me for advice on investments in China. I would say uh, if I had money, uh, following is not, is not investment advice. Um, I would probably consider investing in China. I would probably invest in um, 
I, I might wait a little bit because valuations are high. Again, maybe this too much detail, but I think valuations are a little high still, but they, uh, I think there's a lot of um, really interesting opportunities in China. So again, the consumer digital platforms, consumer internet digital platforms of the past are no longer being made or, or really funded at this point. It's been consumer brands, enterprise software, right? Cloud, and then uh, hard, the sort of quote unquote hard tech, which is a lot of, a ton of healthcare. Healthcare was the largest category uh, last quarter by venture. And then um, also, uh, I, I think I would be interested in sort of quote unquote advanced manufacturing. Uh, based on my own personal expertise, I'd probably still go with just cloud and enterprise software. But if I had a partner that really understood healthcare, I think I would, yeah, I'd probably look at healthcare still. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, I think we, we should uh, wrap up here now that we're at the, uh, the hour mark. And uh, Ray, I really appreciate you taking the time to come and speak with our YCWSF members. And thank you everyone for coming and submitting your questions. And then Ray, is there anything else you wanted to kind of share about Tech Buzz, or do you have sort of any uh, podcasts or anything coming up that you want to mention to our members? Um, I mean, I just did, I did a sort of similar-ish interview actually <laughs> like this with the SCMP's uh, CEO, Gary, on their oh, internet great. report. So I would recommend it's like a, a very basic uh, 50 page, well, it's 50 pages PDF, but it, it gives a really great overview of many of the topics that we talked about. Um, not, not the exact same overlap, but I think it's worth reading. And um, I would just, I would, I would say, I think, in general, I find that, you know, I have a lot of friends in media, so I'm not saying that they're trying to uh, misguide or mislead, but I think it is very difficult sometimes, even when I read a very fact-based article that is 100% correct and all, but without context, it's very easy to jump to, you know, an unproductive conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, so I think having that context is really important. And if you, uh, if you, don't have it, then I'm not really quite sure what you can. I was about to say, actually. is there any quick fix to that? But no, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I've looked at actually the internet report you've talked about before, and it's a really great overview. I don't think it solves all the context questions, but that might be a good right. place to, uh, to start. I mean, yeah, I even have a lot of, uh, you know, questions. And um, so right now, I'll, I'll just share with you guys one book that I'm reading right now. Maybe if you sign up for our newsletter, I will share the full notes. Um, sometime in the future. Right now, I'm sharing the full notes with our uh, paid community, but uh, there's a really, uh, there are a couple of really great books, but the one I'm reading right now is, it uh, doesn't have a Chinese, it uh, doesn't have an English title, but if you, if you speak Chinese, called Zhishen, uh, Zhishen Zhinei, oh, Zhishen Shinei, sorry, Zhishen Shinei, and it's by Lan Xiaohuan, who is a Fudan professor of economics, and he basically wrote it because he believed that, um, you know, in his teaching post, he was seeing that in, in even in Chinese universities, Chinese students were not being taught how the Chinese government actually works. They were being taught these Western ideals, right, of, you know, economics, and it has no it basically does not fit on the, on, the, on the ground reality. So he wrote this book to try to educate the public. So it's, it's actually very basic um, on the history of the government and how it, like how the major policies affect, um, you know, how it makes investments and, uh, you know, the budget shortfall. Like if you're ever curious about like debt, why does the local government debt such an issue? What went into it? He, he gives the historical context. So then I think for me, that's really helpful because then I'm not just hearing the fact that like, oh, China's government, local government debt is out of control because mm -hmm. then it just makes me think that, well, what are these people doing? They're so irresponsible, but, you know, uncovering like the, you know, steps went through seven or whatever that led to it and you're like oh okay these there were logical reasons why this happened and then here are the things that are being done to disentangle that mess right so anyways i, I felt like uh, i feel like uh books that give context like that are very helpful um yeah so no i mean i guess short answer no no shortcut to it i mean you kind of have to learn some of the history how the government got to its current position and uh that yeah, and I'm sure you. there's going to be there's going to be a lot more um, content creators who are going to give better, you know, better and better overviews 
Uh, so it'll be easier in the future, but I think right now there's no shortcut. I do, mm -hmm. I, I do know various organizations trying to build these curriculums. So, so maybe even in as uh, short as a year, there'll be, there'll be more. I'm, I'm helping out with one on uh, China Tech specifically, but I think they also have um, things on, you know, all, all of China. So simple answer, make sure you follow Ray, follow the Tech Buzz community, <laughs> follow her on Twitter, and then when she builds out these new curriculums, you'll know about them. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for uh, joining us, Ray. I, I really, really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah, thanks, everyone.